Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, just making sure, can, am I, am I audible? I can hear you. Okay, great. Great. Um, welcome to, uh, we, uh, we were just joking about <clears throat> some of us about being, this is my first official back to school event. So, uh, well, if this is the same for you, welcome. <laughs> uh, we have a slide show if you'll just give me one moment to get this up okay there. <clears throat> excuse me so we are um it's i'm daisy levy and uh, my co-facilitators co-hosts are jermaine jones and kimberly ross we are all uh, faculty in the writing studies program in the Department of Literature. And um, we are also all on the, sorry, you see me multitasking. We are all on the Writer as Witness Committee, um, which is a committee that's formed to uh, sort of uh, orchestrate and administer this whole, uh, this whole program, this Writer's Witness program. Um, and as many of you or you all probably know, our book this year is Isaac Bailey's Why Didn't We Riot? A Black Man in Trump Land. Um, and just briefly, I want to, there we go, um, give you just a little bit of information. Some of you already know about the Writer's Witness program. Some of you may have heard of it, but don't know very much. So I just wanted to share a little bit about it. Um, it's uh, it's sponsored by the Writing Studies Program. Um, it's you know modeled after one book programs or community read programs, if you're familiar with those, in which an entire community is tasked with reading a particular book and having discussions and various events around that book. Um, the te the text, the way we select the text is a long and almost a year long process. We solicit nominations from our colleagues, both within our program and across uh, within our department, but also across the College of Arts and Sciences and then other colleges, all the other colleges at AU as well. So we get input from all over the place. We have um, input nominations come from students. They come from faculty, staff, senior administrators. Um, and then we we have a quite a sizable <clears throat> list of nominations. So our next task is to whittle that down. And we have various criteria, um, things like it must be a nonfiction book. It must be incorporate research in some way. Um, it does not need to be academic research. Uh, it must be on a, an, a topical issue, a recent and topical issue. And we have to be able to afford bringing the author to campus. That's the the, la the one very uh, pragmatic criteria. Um, and then we, so we go through a series of whittling down. Um, then the committee, we get, we, we had a first run at a short list. We read the books. We talk about the books amongst ourselves in the committee. We whittle that list down to a, an even shorter list. And we bring that back to our department for a vote. Um, and also to, to deans of the colleges. So it is a, it's a, representative vote <clears throat> not a not a sort of top-down decision um and then our director of the writing studies who is now Kelly Joyner who I believe is with us today um gets to engage in all of the practical details the committee doesn't have to do all of that stuff which is great thanks Kelly <laughs> um so that's the that's the selection process uh, once we have a book, students, incoming students are um, sent the title of the book and are able to get, get a copy of the book at a discounted rate through the campus bookstore. Um, and we uh, ask them to read the book before they get to campus. That doesn't always happen um, under, for understandable reasons. <clears throat> but in any case, all the writing studies courses, first year, all the first year writing courses, make some use of this book in their classes. And in particular, um, in early September, so this year it is September 6th, we bring the writer to campus for a day 
festival, <laughs> basically. Um, they meet, the, the writer meets with faculty, they meet with the honors program, and then in the evening, there is a um, full, uh, a large scale interview and Q&A session with all first year students, anybody or anybody who's in writing 101, 102, 100, sorry, 103, 104, 106. It's a long list of writing courses. Um, and that is uh, one of the highlights, I will say for sure. It is often one of the first times that these uh, students are in such close proximity to a published author. They get to ask questions. Um, they get to hear a writer talk about their own experience, putting words out into the world. And that is um, always really, uh, really exciting and gratifying, not just for us in the writing studies program, but for students. And I think for the writer too, the, I've, I've now been here several years and I can say that the writers come away feeling sort of excited and special that mm -hmm. all of these students have read their book and are interested. Um, I think co-hosts, co Kim Germain, have I missed anything? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> so um, we understand that maybe everybody hasn't had a chance to read the book yet, or or maybe many of you have. Um, but just in case you haven't, we did want to give a little bit of background about the book. Um, and rather than me reading the slide, I'll just um, I'll just say that uh, Mr. Bailey is a um, widely recognized writer, journalist, teacher, leader in various communities. Um, and he is, um, this book is, it's organized in chapters. So it's not a straight, a, a, the narrative is not a straight narrative, meaning it doesn't begin at the beginning and end at the ending. Um, but each of the chapters build on each other just the same. And in these chapters, he is um, doing a lot of a lot of important things. He's certainly, as this slide says, reflecting on his own experiences, but he's also putting those experiences into conversation with history, with the legal system, with uh, with um, religious institutions. Um, and considering that in the current moment that we live in, of course, this book was published before the um, quite dramatic change in transition in leadership. Excuse me, my cat is having his way with the blinds, um, but still entirely relevant as we know his book is. Um, and what what comes next is that each of each of us are going to share a little bit with you about what some one thing that we find particularly compelling about the book, ways that we're thinking about using it in our class, um, and ways we think things that we think make this book really important. So I'm going to stop talking now and turn my microphone, as it were, over to Kim. Thanks, Daisy. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to move through this as quickly as possible because I can talk about this stuff all day. Um, so one of the things that um, when Jermaine and Daisy and I were in discussion um, in terms of how we, want, we were going to present this information was, um, and Daisy helped me find language for it because my emotions were kind of all over the place and my thinking was all over the place. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, but one thing that Daisy said is I was articulating just the historical piece is that it is looking at the ways in which what we're seeing going on now, you know, is resonant of things that have happened in the past, the events, the philosophies of the past, um, the, the narratives of the past that have been constructed about Black people. And so one of the things that 
I think if we're going to talk about race in particular um, for my students, I like to look at the origins of the construction of race. We know that race is socially constructed um, and we know that there's pseudoscience behind that. It's grounded in pseudoscience. Um, and these um, ideas primarily really came into solidification during the, during the Enlightenment. Were there those types of ideas going on before the Enlightenment period? Of course, you can look at things like in, in Spain, the Spanish Inquisition. You can even look in the colonies or not even the colonies before colonization. You can look at the treatment of indigenous people um, by the conquistadors. Um, but when we're talking about racial construction, the formation of that as a concept, we look to the enlightenment thinkers. And so um, I teach a course on the rhetoric of the civil rights movement. And so last semester, what I had students do was I always have them read a text to ground them in some um, type of historical you know, um, lens. And so um, I had them read um, the Enlightenment chapter from Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram Kendi. And students were, for lack of a better word, aghast. And maybe I could add perplexed. And they're like, how is it that this time of revolution, you know, in looking at the ways in which the natural world worked and the social world worked and politics, all of that, um, and these discoveries, how is it that people that we look up to, the Immanuel Kants, the Voltaires, the um, Carl Linnaeuses, how are these the people, how, how are these people constructing these ideas about power, and, and dominance. And so that is something that I start with. Um, I was actually reading something from um, Emmanuel um, Eze, who was a philosopher um, at DePaul University, a Nigerian philosopher. And he was, um, he wrote a book, it's dated now on Kant. Um, and it's uh, looking at Kant's philosophy um, through a moral lens, and it's called A Critical Reader. Um, and Kant has a section on race in that particular um, chapter of the, of a particular chapter of the book. And in it, he gives his anthropological breakdown of um, this hierarchy. And um, of course, he has Europeans at the top. Um, then he has what he calls Orientals or Asians, um, sorry. Then he um, talks about um, um, indigenous people, then he talks about black people. And Europeans, of course, are folks of reason. They're folks of light. They are folks of morality. All the way at the bottom, black people, people who, should be trained and the ways in, they in which they should be trained is through um, whippings. Um, we have thick skin according to Kant, so therefore um, whips should not be used on us, but split bamboo um, to break through that skin. Um, we are lazy, we are ignorant, we show no signs of any intellectual capacity whatsoever. So starting with those construction, that construction and having students perhaps work through an activity that I've used with them is I post um, legal paper up around the room and I will put titles or labels on each one of those pieces of paper and it's different marginalized groups. And students walk around and they each write a stereotype. So I'm moving into stereotypes. Um, and they just go around the room doing that. And you can hear them laughing. You can hear them you know, talking about this. And so I will ask them after they're finished, why are you laughing? And they'll say, because this is absurd. Yes, 
Indeed, it is absurd, but look at how the ways in which policies have been constructed, institutions have been constructed, unwritten rules have been constructed in order to solidify and maintain and sustain power. Look at the ways in which genocide has been enacted. And of course, enslavement has been enacted, Jim Crow, lynchings, all of those different things. And so one of the ideas that I'm thinking to have students do is to dissect the anatomy of a stereotype. What is the origin of the stereotype? Where did it come from? What's the contextual information? And trace that historical stereotype and look to see how it has influenced um, politics. Um, how has it influenced the prison industrial complex, healthcare, um, education, and then who is debunking these stereotypes? Who's presenting counter narratives? And I'm not necessarily looking for, you know, people that are renowned, but who are everyday people that maybe we can construct some type of ethnographic um, um, processes and talk to people to see that, you know, there are everyday ordinary people of color who are countering these very old and centuries long stereotypes that have influenced life for different communities in the country. And I think that um, Daisy and Jermaine are telling me to hurry up. Um, the other um, theme that is discussed in the text is evangelical Christianity's complicity with white supremacy and the opposing frameworks of racial reconciliation. For sake of time, I'm going to just concentrate briefly on racial reconciliation versus racial justice. Racial reconciliation, um, and this is coming strictly from a biblical church standpoint. Um, people who engage in racial reconciliation are people who um, look at the sin of racism as a personalized belief. All right. So everybody's the center. Sin may be sin in the form of racism may be your issue. So the way that we deal with this is strictly from a biblical standpoint. Um, so often pastors, well, white pastors of multicultural or multiracial churches will not deal with the, the issue of racism. They will talk about reconciliation, meaning we will go to dinner with you. We will participate in the sacraments, such as washing your feet. But when it comes to race itself and dealing with the structural aspects of race, we're not gonna deal with that. So pastors can all often be silent about it, or you'll see these um, this rhetoric about, well, both sides, all sides are wrong. Um, all sides have their issues. Um, whereas a racial justice standpoint, these pastors are talking about racism from the pulpit. They're talking about how do we partner with, with churches that look different from us in order to work through the hardness? How do we work through the pain? How do we work through the trauma? And to work together to actually bring about a true sense of unity. Um, and we're not doing this just for the sake of unity, but we're doing it for the sake of a true unification um, in keeping with the principles that we're supposed to be living by. So the quote that I um, pulled out was the following um, from the text um, that Bailey states, some days they prostrated themselves before black people for the sin of, sin of racism and slavery that often led to the short-term urgency to resolve racial differences that would produce racial dinners and cookouts. I watched them demand that black people prostrate themselves for the sin of not having risen above racism, that black people respect the Southern white evangelical Christian love of the Confederacy, that black people become colorblind, that black people think why we voted for Democrats who supposedly split on the Bible with an embrace of gay marriage and a supposed penchant for killing babies in the womb. 
So that is a framework in which he is talking about racial reconciliation instead of his pastor who sat him down for 20 years um, as, for talking about issues of racism. Um, and he did not leave the church. He remained in the church. He suffered under that sort of framework that demanded unity to the on the to the sacrifice of his own wellness and self um, consciousness. Um, and the last thing I would just want to quickly go through is looking at trying to subvert this myth of the monolithic black community in favor of thinking about diverse black communities. And I'm looking again at ethnography for that. Um, when I read this book, for the first time I read it, I had to go back and reread it because I was like, this is not my story. I do not come from um, a red state. I've never lived in a red state. I grew up in DC. I grew up seeing black people in power. I grew up seeing black people who were middle-class and affluent. Um, it was not my story. And I had to go and I had to talk some things out with Jermaine as well as my best friend, both of who have roots in North Carolina to actually work me through the reasons why you would stay in a church for 20 years when they basically demoted you from something that you enjoyed, that the author enjoyed doing. I had no idea. Um, and it just goes to show that although people stereotype Black people is thinking in one way or existing in one way, we exist in so many different ways, in so many different narratives, and we have so many different stories and backgrounds. So I probably talk too much, so thank you. <laughs> awesome, thank you, Kim. I don't think you talked too long at all. That was really great. Um, and in fact, what you were just talking about transitions really nicely into the way I wanted to um, share with everybody here today. So I, I, I come to this, to this book and to this uh, workshop from my own particular position as a white woman um, who is committed to anti-racist and social justice initiatives and practices, uh, but who is always, always learning. Um, and um, I want, uh, you know, I have I have a whole lot of thoughts about this book, so I'm trying to um, keep myself sort of organized here. I I one of the things that is important to me about this book, which I already mentioned earlier in my very rushed introduction, um, is that this book is chirotic, absolutely, in terms of um, out where we are today in this country. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to rehash all of the, all of the things that are happening, but the ways in which um, a reckoning with American history is being criminalized in public schools and in colleges, the ways in which uh, diversity and diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives are being defunded at universities are being um, that professors tenure is sometimes at at risk in other universities and here at American University I think we are really I am really grateful to be in a university that is not in that kind of a situation yet the landscape in which we are immersed is fraught um, and I think that is uh, I feel a deep and a uh, I, I guess the the word I, the only word I can think of is a kind of urgency about bringing conversations, having these conversations publicly and in classrooms because I have colleagues who cannot. Um, so that's that's my that's a sort of a brief position statement on where I'm coming from. Um, I also, you know, I also think that. Um, part of our job, well, uh, part of our job in first year writing, certainly, uh, and all of our jobs teaching undergraduate students is uh, to, to um, cultivate people who can think hard, who can think in difficult ways and um, in, embrace ambiguity and to um, 
make sense of a really a very complicated world. The world is always complicated. There's nothing about this particular moment that makes it more complicated than other times, but it is it is certainly complicated in ways that I did not experience growing up in the 70s. Um, that's which is that's another story, and I could end up on a tangent there. But uh, I, you know, we we chose this book. Um, for all of the reasons that I said above or before, but I, but it's also really important to me that we are reading books that are test, in some ways testimony from people who are not like me. I know what I think, um, that the whole, the whole premise of writer as witness is that uh, everybody witnesses, everybody sees things, and everybody has something to say about those things. And Isaac Bailey has things to say that I need to hear. Um, much, you know, much of what he's talking about, like him saying, is not necessarily, they're not necessarily things that surprised me in the abstract. Um, but they are things that troubled me in the personal you know that this is this this is all his personal experience this is these are these are dreadful dreadful experiences to live under um and um i need to learn from his experiences and his stories so i bring that approach into my writing class uh which is to say part of we do a a semester long project which i i refer to as reflective listening um and we i give them deep listening exercises to do and the 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 writer as witness book is always the book that we is always the text that we listen to critically or listen to reflectively first um and this involves having to uh do some self-exploration because one of the things that I understand from my own discipline is that we read through who we are um, rather than a lot of a lot of students sometimes or still come into college classes thinking they're just reading for information they're just reading for objective fact and um, they've they've one of the one of the skills that I see them needing to develop is to develop this way of listening to uh, listening to the text, but also listening to the text through an awareness of who they are. How does who they are shape what they read or shape what they learn or shape what they hear? And so I, you know, we and we do this consistently through over the whole semester, as I said. But even from the beginning of the semester, I ask them to reflect before before we even talk about the book to reflect on who they are, where do they come from, what kinds of things have they learned about the world, about American history, about um, themselves, about the role of education, about all of this. Um, but also now, what having having maybe looked at the book, maybe having read a little bit of it, or even just knowing the title, what kinds of things do you expect to read about? What kinds of things do you believe you already know that you're bringing to your experience of reading this book and have them write these things down to name them. Um, and this is actually not as easy as it sounds. Uh, they they struggle with that. Like, I don't know what I what I've been taught, <laughs> which is always uh, um, it's a moment of laughter in the class. Uh, but to but to try to surface some of these questions first before we get into talking about the book. And then to talk about the book, and then to have a sort of a post reflection moment, which is to say, what are the kinds of things that I heard in this book that either met my expectations, challenged my expectations, surprised me, taught me something new? Uh, what were there things in the book where I had to stop reading things that challenged my ability to actually read the book? Uh, and, and then to speculate, why? What is it about that? And to make that a part of the, of the whole experience of reading this book, all in an effort to navigate ambiguity and pain, and not so much as a way to focus on pain, but to focus on growth. Um, and to rather than to be afraid of uh, things challenging received belief or 
perceived expectations to consider multiple understandings, multiple ways of understanding the world, and to um, to bear witness to a writer as witness. Um, so I think I will I will pause I will stop there and I will give the microphone back to Jermaine now. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so I'm actually gonna start here first. Um, I have a few things to get through. I won't hold you guys hostage. I just wanna make a few points um, and just talk a little bit about the text and the way that I utilize the text within my, my courses. Um, but I wanna start here first. Um, you guys can just drop a brief answer in the chat. Do any of this, these words, these phrases look familiar? And if so, could you just, in the chat, just drop something um, in regard to what these words, the bell they ring, or have you seen them? Do they look familiar? Uh, let's see. Absolutely. So, absolutely. Uh, author says uh, that they're part of AU's value statement. Absolutely. So I'm on, I'm actually going to start here. All right. This is, I think this is important when we um decide to engage in tech. So the words here on the left are the mission, right? To advance knowledge, foster intellectual curiosity, build community, empower lives of purpose, service, and leadership. And on the right, it's the institutions, American universities, uh, values, integrity, excellent, excellence, human dignity, community, diversity, equity accessibility, DEI, basically, DEAI, um, free uh, inquiry and thinking, and we're seeking truth, basically, and impact. Next slide. So I believe that those are the things that um, we need to think about as we potentially shape and mold our pedagogy, our, our classroom assignments, right? Um, and also, based upon what we just read, that information um, to me, um, basically validates why we need to be focusing on a book such as Bailey's in the first place and other texts like it. Um, so I just want to go through, just, just, just mention a couple of things to why this piece is important and just the society we live in today. So in my classes, I give a lot of analogies. And one of the analogies that I give is I tell my students that Black literature is the defense attorney for Black culture. Right. Um, and I say that because black literature in the written and in the vernacular form, right, the music as well, is basically um, it allows for black folks to, to, to negotiate their oneness, to negotiate their worth. It's been like that decade after decade. Uh, I'm a huge hip hop fan, uh, music fan, period, um, because of my mom. But black black literature in the vernacular and in and, and the written form, it tells a story. It narrates black life. Um, so I want to say that to say this, uh, we live in a time of extreme attack, a time when Florida is attacking academic freedom. We live in a time where politicians are attempting to drape black folks' history in this country with opaque truths, um, and downplay their historical relevance. Um, um, the same folks are trying to revise the reality of the black experience, right? And, and, and here's what's dangerous about that. These same folks utilize straw man and red herring fallacies to avoid accountability for explaining their actions. Um, we also live in a time where white rage is digested while black rage is demonized. Basically, black and brown folks do not possess rage privilege at all in any space. Um, bigotry is weaponized and used as a political Excalibur. Um, we also live in a time when Donald Trump is envisioning being the next Eugene Debs. I'm, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Eugene Debs. He actually ran for president back in, the, I think, the 1920 election uh, from prison, an Atlanta federal prison. Where am I going with this? Um, everything I just underscored and highlighted, it embraces bits and pieces of what both of my colleagues mentioned, more so Kim, white patriarchal power, that structure in America. Um, and as I zip through this, this information here, it won't take long, guys, 
I'm actually going to just talk a little bit about some of the assignments that I formulate um, from this. So here's here's my quote, right? One thing I love about Bailey and what he does in this piece is he's 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 very transparent. A lot of times it's hard to be transparent about your weaknesses. Um, there was there were there are points in this book where I actually thought that I wrote the material. I had to put it down, and I had to take a step back and and think about uh, some of the things that he that he wrote. So here's my quote: Let me tell you what I am: a broken man with a broken past who fears his, he who fears he's inevitably headed toward a broken future. I don't want your pity though. Don't need you to believe I'm a forever victim, forever licking his wounds and cursing his pain. I'm not. I know how to handle challenges, overcome obstacles. I've spent a lifetime perfecting that craft. That, that section there is, is paramount. That's what being Black in America requires. Black success is accompanied by nightmares. And what he's doing is, is this, and I don't want to spoil it for guys, for the folks who haven't read it. Isaac Bailey, from the death of his brother, to seeing his dad um, physically abuse his mom, to friends getting killed, to working in white dominated spaces where he's that token black person, um, he actually developed a physical ailment. And he basically talks about, and this is the part where I actually thought I wrote because I couldn't articulate it when I was younger coming out of college. But Bailey just talks about how this anachronistic form of racism, right? This form of racism that's actually, it feels as if it should be in another decade, another period, another time. Um, it's found its way to more contemporary times and it's mentally and emotionally um, 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 killing him. And he talks about how America um, will uh, take Barack, uh, former President Barack Obama, Ben Carson, and all these um, uh, these types of folks, and use that as a benchmark for all black men. And we all know that just because you work hard in America doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be successful. He has an issue with that. He has an issue. He understands that he was one of the few that were a that was one of the few folks who were able to make it out. Um, so. Again, the contemporary racism Bailey details is ana anachronistic, right? And it's it's somewhat like a banshee, like a ghost that just haunts him. Um, and it's that same racism that we that that if we go back and do some do some reading on James uh, Vardaman, who was the governor of Mississippi, who said, "If it is necessary, every Negro in the state will be lynched." I support lynching to maintain white supremacy, or. South Carolina Senator uh, Strom Thurmond, if you go back and do some reading on Strom, who actually fathered a child with a teenage 14 or 15 year old black housekeeper, uh, Strom, and, and well, I'll say this first, um, all the bayonets of the army cannot force the Negro into our homes, into our schools, our churches, and our places of recreation and amusement. There are more quotes that I have, but these are just some of the few. And from these quotes, I construct these, these assignments for my students. I allow my students to explore um, things like cultural appropriation versus um, cultural, uh, cultural appreciation. I allow us to talk about um, trauma, which is what Bailey gives us. How do we, how have we processed our own personal traumas? Um, and in order to, to do this, we must take a historical approach. Um, I don't think we can zero in on contemporary racism. Um, and even with racism, now racism, the new racism is money now, or having access to be able to have access to um, um, wealth. Um, but we can't do any of this without exploring um, um, the subject area historically. So I take an historical approach. Um, and one of the approaches I take is here at the bottom, I'm almost done guys. Um, so there's something favorably interesting about Black culture, right? And I'll say this because um, um, thank you. So Sojourner Truth, right? Um, Bell Hooks, Francis Wesley, James Baldwin, Brent Staples, 
Daniel Black, Claude McKay, Paul Butler, and Charles J. Jones. Um, here's what I want you guys to hear, right? Let me pull this up. So, I apologize, guys. My, 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 oh, here we go. All right. So, there's a part of what Bailey gets into that's vital. And it's the, and this is something that, um, the, the book that I'm actually finishing now, I've been doing research on this for maybe the last three years, right? And I wanted to take this approach. Um, rarely do we talk about the psychological effects of subjugation. Rarely do we talk about the, the emotional and the health issues that come from being subjugated year after year after year after year. I tell my mom, you know, um, so there's a huge portion of my family um, uh, don't eat pork. I'll put it that way. And I tell my mom, like, you know, um, her ancestors and her uh, older aunties and grandmas and things like that. I was like, well, I don't think everybody passed from high blood pressure, right? You know, they eat that pork in the Bible belt. Um, and I get into this whole thing about this approach where um, being scrutinized um, and being um, subject, uh, subjugated to less, it wears on you. And there's research to, to, uh, to support this. So that brings us to um, this historical approach. And I just want to touch a little bit on what I want to reinforce what Kim said about the evangelical Christianity traditions. Bailey gets into this whole thing in, about Christianity in the South. And I don't know, um, I'm originally from Washington, D.C., born in D.C., lived in D.C., but I ended up moving to North Carolina later. And I had to find out that Christianity in that Bible Belt is a little bit different than Christianity in the North. Folks take it seriously, okay? Um, but the way that he describes this evangelical Christianity and, and the way that Kim framed it, um, Kim hit the nail on the head. So Bailey just gives us a glimpse at this form of Christianity, the traditions and how the traditions mimic the culture around white America. It takes on a conservative view, um, um, especially when it comes to gender and sexuality. Um, basically evangelical means being rate, uh, radically remade. Also, we can look at it like this, evangelicalism equates to republicanism, Republicanism, right? And we know these two forces create a movement that is not about politics or religion, but about, about white patriarchal power. Where do we, we see this also in Hollywood? If you go back and do, and this is something that my students, we, we deep dive in. I have my students to go back and do some mild research on the history of acting in, in, in Hollywood and how they wouldn't cast Asian men only um, black folks would only get cast for certain roles to perpetuate the stereotype. And this is the exact thing that Bailey's talking about. Um, um, and to, to finish off the piece about trauma, um, Bailey doesn't, and it's funny because Bailey and Daniel Black, Daniel Black wrote this piece called Don't Cry For Me. They do the exact same thing. Um, they don't give their fathers a pass for physically abusing their moms. But what they do is at different times, and, and Bailey does this, he comes to terms to what America has created in his father. He comes to terms to what the black plight, what it did to his dad. And I list James Baldwin here because James Baldwin wrote uh, this piece called Letter to My Nephew. And what he does is he tries to, he tries to send his nephew a, a heads up of the America that you will inherit. Hopefully you can handle it a, bit, a lot better than your dad and I did. So here's my point. Sojourner Truth, True, uh, uh, Bell Hooks, Francis Whistling, Isis Papers, James Baldwin, Brent Staples wrote this piece called um, Black Men in Public Space. Um, Daniel Black, I just mentioned, Carl McKay's um, wrote a piece in regard to um, the, ninth, uh, the uh, uh, 1912 uh, Red Summer, the Bloody Summer. Um, um, and um, Charles J. Jones' piece from Poverty to Prosperity. My point is all these folks, and, I, and, I, and this is a diverse list from a diverse epoch. These folks are saying the exact same thing. And this is something else my students and I, are, are, we explore. Why are these folks saying the same exact thing? Decade after decade, why is the plight still the same? Well, the grassroots of the plight is still the same, right? Um, and lastly, the thing I, last thing I wanna talk on, on touch on is um, America's uh, attempt to not believe racism even exists. Um, for all my law folks in here, you may be familiar with the term Rashomon effect, I'm not sure. Um, and pretty much what that is, is the wash of mind effect is basically being able to receive information from someone. And based on how 
credible you um, view that person that's giving you the information. It can be it can be life saving information, but if you don't value that person, and if you um, 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 use inf uh, implicit biases to influence your view of that person, you won't believe them. And this is what America has done throughout history. Back in uh, 1944, there's this Swedish um, scientist by the name of um, Gunnar Myrdal. He was hired by the uh, Carnegie Institute up in New York to come across uh, the country and do research on racism. And this is this is what happened. You got uh, American Denial is the book. Um, so he had to become what he was exploring. And long story short, um, he, the, uh, the title American Denial, it basically comes from the contradiction. America presents this, this, this um, one door that's open, but when you go through the door, you see that equality doesn't exist. And he went down to the South, he had a team of folks, and this is how powerful um, um, the experience was. It nearly physically almost killed him being subjugated and being around these folks and being being amongst these folks in the South, it literally almost physically killed them. Um, but that didn't have to happen. America doesn't have to hire a gunner murder or anyone else. Um, there's some other, some other cases where that happened. We've been saying this. Sojourner Truth said it, Bell Hooks said it, Francis Westling said it, James Baldwin, Brent Staples, Daniel Black, I've said it. Claude McKay's said it. Paul Butler. Oh, and I forgot. I didn't, uh, Paul Butler's. Um, he's a, a friend of mine. He's over at Georgetown. He's a um, former federal prosecutor. He wrote this book called Choco. He recently said it in his recent book. So, this is part of the issue that Bailey is having. No one's listening. Um, we shouldn't have to have a gun of murder to come explore something that we've been already telling you um, um, for decades, for the most part. Um, I'll get into, I'll, I'll, I'll leave a little time for you guys, just in case you guys may have some questions in terms of more assignments. Um, and if I wasn't clear on the assignments, I actually pulled from this 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 book um, and in my class, I can clarify that later. But for the sake of time, I just wanna um, pass it back to Kim and Daisy. Kim, do you want to take us take us into the breakout groups or you want me to? You can. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um at this point we are we would like for it to to um stop talking and let you all talk with each other. Uh and um we'll have we'll take about it's 11 50, so we'll take about 15 minutes. Um just gonna assign you into um random breakout groups please introduce yourselves to each other get to know each other talk with each other even though it's on zoom this is always a really important part i think of the beginning of the semester um and also uh share just share some thoughts perhaps you've already read the book perhaps you haven't what kinds of things are you thinking about did did we mention anything that you thought would be um in, uh, helpful or that you'd like to riff on or expand? Um, do you have concerns or, um, you know, pressing questions about ways to use this book in your classes? Um, so just to, to share all of that stuff amongst yourselves. And just like, as I say to my own classes, as you're, if, if it's helpful for somebody in that group to keep some notes, we will ask for people to share out as a large group when we come back. Um, so I'm going to just quickly create the breakout rooms um, and have fun. Wait, we didn't go to breakout rooms, did we? Mm -mm, no. Um, we, we, On advice from the CTRL folks, I did not include us in the breakout rooms. Um, if you want to jump into breakout rooms, you're totally welcome to. Oh, no. No. I'm going to stop sharing. I'll pause the recording as well. Thank you very much. I was just going to ask if I could do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
Okay, I think uh, we have, for the most part, everyone back. Um, so this is the time when I would love for, for, for you all to basically just share two aspects or two motifs from the text or just the discussion in general um, that you think will be useful in your class or you can maybe some way, somehow manipulate an assignment out of, out of the piece or even just spark some very tangible class discussions which assignments typically lead or come or conceive are, are conceived from class discussions. So um, does anyone wanna just talk on or, or mention a few motifs or um, assignments or discussions you think you can have with this piece? And you don't have to type it in the chat. You can actually, um, if you want to just raise your hand and have at it, that's fine. Gretchen? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I always have trouble with the Zoom controls for some reason. You've been doing it for so long, and yet, um, no. Uh, I, I, one of the things that I've been thinking about is the I teach um, in the AU experience curriculum. Um, and so one of the things that, uh, one of the sort of key skills is of self-reflection. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking about um, was the way that the text, um, the little bit that I've read thus far seems uh, also structured on a sense of this is a narrative that I told myself. This is a narrative that I told about myself. This is a narrative that I um, that um, I sort of believed in, um, and I have you know come to revise, rethink that um, for these reasons. And I just I found it um, you know I, I the the as far as I've gotten is thinking about this as a useful model for that kind of self reflection that doesn't just mean I'm the hero of my story. I am the hero of my story, but it is in involved a lot of growth <laughs> along the way. Um, and so, and so I think that, yeah, so that was just something that sort of, uh, I, I thought about in, 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 in reading this, um, and in through this discussion as well. I think that's so awesome. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just going to jump in. Cause that, that lines up with the kind of work that I'm asking students to do in my own class, like to be able to sort of point to like, you know, uh, this is something else I think students often uh, particularly maybe um, first year students or students who are just coming through high school I, and I'm making some assumptions which are deeply flawed right but that the idea of reflection is is uh, sort of not fully baked you know like what it's not just looking back and recounting the past right it's it's right. there's the kind of interrogation or a, and I that's a that's an intense word to use but you know that's it's it's there's a there's a a kind of a change or an or an intentional intentionality it's just so being able to point to an example of a particularly complicated way of telling your own narrative that's that's pretty great if there's something called um I don't know if I was talking to somebody about this or I read it I'm not sure or I heard it um, and it's your, for lack of a better term, it's your racial autobiography where you, you know, you look at, you know, questions and think about questions such as, you know, did you talk about who are you first of all, who are you, you know, and how does that fit into, um, things that you hear in the media? How, did you talk about race at home? Um, did you see racial incidents at school? If so, what happened? How were those handled? Who was punished or penalized? Who wasn't penalized? You know, and it's really doing, yeah, that deep work, going back to that whole thing we were talking about in while you were in the breakout rooms, that deep story. What is my deep story? Um, um, and how I, I look at race and I look at my placement within race, um, or am I even really seen at all because I am the norm? Yeah. I don't have to think about those things, you know, 
when I go into a meeting or I'm in a certain space, I don't think about those things, you know, um, but who does have to think about certain things? And Kim, it, to, I'm, I'm sorry, to, and to that point, um, and this actually, and again, Kim, I didn't, I, I just wanted to piggyback off what you just said, because this is something, this is important um, to connect with what you just said, but um, so one of the discussions I have with this piece, I just, I try to use, make my life experiences, I try to merge them into what, what we're doing, but I, t I told my, I tell my students, um, during the heart of the pandemic, um, there was a point where I, I mean, I really wasn't worried about, um, uh, and this is, and this is, this is part of the whole, um, the cognitive part that Bailey talks about, um, Kim, you just said it, some folks just don't have to worry about certain features affixed to their lives. I wasn't really worried about COVID. I felt like I, I took care of my body enough. I worked out enough, whatever the case may be. I was more fearful of having on a mask at night and leaving the gym. Mm. Um, and I mentioned that to a couple of my home, my, my friends who are teach, uh, uh, teach at UNC Chapel Hill, um, a few of my, um, my buddies from college um, who are, are white males. And they couldn't wrap their minds around the concept because that's just not a feature of their life. So those clandestine and invisible features, these are the things that the discussions we have in my class, and, and, and a lot of times students will say, Professor Jones, I never thought about that either. Okay, so how does it affect you now that you know that? How does it affect me, right? There are different levels to, to, to understanding how race, um, how race um, propagates. So... Um, there's so many different angles and, and, and I tell folks, I will tell folks too, you know, we don't have to be, um, um, experts on the topic, right? We just need to be able to relate this tangibly to students, be authentic, contextual, and assignments will produce themselves and the class discussion will go well in most cases, I believe in all cases, if, if it's facilitated, um, in a, in a fashion where it's productive, if that makes sense. Does anybody else want to share things they talked about in their group? Do you, uh, this is a question I I have. Do do does anybody feel nervous or concerned about having some of these discussions in class or ways to ways to incorporate the book? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Would you be willing to say a little bit more about what, what, uh, what kind of concern or nervousness that is? Well, I'm white, and for me, engaging a text usually means encouraging differing perspectives. Right. And right. I'm just I'm very concerned about, um, you know, encouraging a conversation that could turn racist or in, on, on, you know, subconsciously, yeah, I'm just very concerned. Obviously I'm committed. I'll stop talking. It makes me very nervous. Well, I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it, Allison. You know, I, I worry about that too, you know, it, in the, in the, and I, forgive me if I'm talking over people, but in the context of trying to make a space safe for people to, to engage with difficult material, what if that means also it makes it safe for people to say what I would consider truly offensive and potentially violent things? <laughs> um, and I, you know, my experience is that students at AU don't do that, but you just don't ever really know, right, what's going to happen. Um, and I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'll stop talking and perhaps David wants to speak to that to, to. Yeah. Um, so I am a student, like I was a student here and I remember my writing, uh, 101 or whatever it was back then, uh, both those classes. Cause I think it was so early on, we read the first section was on a book on 9-11 and then the second one was a book on like the border crisis. And in both those classes, I think, again, because it was early on, some students had the audacity to say very offensive things. And I think that's one of the given things that we kind of 
need to navigate as instructors who like bring in these content is like, are people comfortable enough to say things maybe in their spaces that's perfectly okay but like in you're bringing in a lot of students who I'm like we all come from like more diverse backgrounds so like how do we navigate like you basically saying something that I can consider offensive or a slur and saying that very loudly and openly in a space I, th I think that's so right on, David. I'm sorry, Jermaine, can I just say one thing quickly? Yeah, sure. um, I think particularly because of the, you know, a, refer back to this sense of Kairos that I mentioned earlier, we are living in a particularly ripe, ripe moment for those kinds of things, depending on where other people are coming from, as you say, other, you know, other states with particular legislation or other family systems or whatever. And, um, you know, my, I, I guess I, I also realize we're, we're out of time. So, and I want to give Jermaine a chance to speak. I don't want to be the last voice, but I will say, Allison, to your point, don't do it alone. You know, you have colleagues around you. Um, I, I am also often, I will say that I am also quite upfront with my students about my own position and where I come from. And I feel like that uh, in some ways puts a kind of constraint on the room, but it also lets people know right away that like, um, this is this is who your professor is. So uh, proceed with caution. <laughs> and I don't feel I don't feel bad about that. I actually I've I've come to terms with that. I don't I don't feel bad about potentially shutting down. Um, yeah, Allison, I see your comment in the chat. Absolutely. Here, I guess my my perspective, and then I will stop, is that this is the society, society in which we live, and that shit's happening already. <laughs> so the, I mean, I I don't that doesn't help necessarily, but um, being aware of it, I guess, is one way to start. Okay, I'll stop. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you. It's helpful. Thank. You. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Allison. I'm. I'm it's. I didn't mean to uh, to merge. So so Allison, yeah, everything. Thing that uh, Daisy just said, I, I definitely I, I agree with. Um, you know, the you know one thing is preface everything. You know what you say in terms of um, the text. Just preface it with set some ground rules, right? You know, um, be transparent about the text. Be self reflective. Uh, obviously, be in tune with the content, but just set ground rules. Ground rules. You, you're facilitating um, that space, and you know. Um, and this is something that I do. I just let students know, you know, healthy conversation is definitely welcome. Um, um, and there, and then there may be times where I'll, I'll have to somewhat make sure I'm facilitating, you know, a lot of the conversations. But even when I do the, the cooperative break, breakout groups and small creating those small communities, but for the most part, if you, I just feel like if you set those expectations, you're transparent. Daisy just mentioned, and me knowing Daisy, I know she she does. She she basically you know, um, underscores, um, her position and things like that. And I, and I, and I, and, you know, some things are just happening. We just can't help that even in my, you know, but my classes, but I think for the most part, you can definitely be successful. And if you have any questions, just reach out to me, um, Kim as well, um, or anyone you feel comfortable talking to, you know? Yeah. And can I say really quick, I think also, um, setting from day one, the, the reality that we are in a learning community. And what does that mean? What does community actually mean? That means that we're gonna have support in this classroom. Um, but let me say this also, there are just certain things I will not tolerate from you, point blank. <laughs> I will not tolerate that, um, but setting community and engaging. And I think we talked about this at one point last semester, Jermaine, trying to, as, as much as you can, setting up this expe expectation that we are a family in this classroom. And we will say things that sometimes, or we can say things that, that are going to hurt each other we don't want to, but they may. 
how do we deal with those things? And how are we gonna deal with them as a community, as a family? How can we build trust so that we're kind of heading off with everything um, Daisy and Jermaine said? How can we try to waylay if we're building trust, if we're building a family, if we're building community? How do we use that rhetorical um, listening? And how can we also be rhetorical in what we actually say, making wise choices so that I'm not hurting my family member? So that's the way that I approach it, um, as well as setting those ground rules and holding students um, to ground rules that they'll even set. You know. How are we gonna how are we gonna navigate this? This is a tough conversation. We got people in Florida, people in Texas saying one thing. They don't, you know, you may come from those types of states, those red states, or you know, you may have people in democratic states saying things that are opposite or similar. How are we gonna navigate these things? And let me say this: don't feel like you have to be perfect. Don't do it. Don't feel like you have to be perfect because I know I'm not. Somebody told me last semester I was being biased and I was like, provide me with an explanation of how I'm doing that. None, none. So don't feel you have to be perfect. You're gonna make mistakes, but that's okay. You know, you're not going to ruin anybody's life whatsoever <laughs> or you're not gonna have chaos in your classroom. You're just not going to. So can I can can I know we're way over time. I just want to I want to echo what Kim says. And again, this is like me coming in saying something somebody's already said before, but I have had plenty of students come back to me and say it has even if a conversation in class or something that somebody else has said or behaviors of another student are are um, oppressive, microaggressive, or any of those things. I have plenty of students come back to me and say, at least we had space to try to deal with this. You know, that none of it, particularly my students of color, when uh, students of color, you know, none of this is new to them. <laughs> these are, this is their, these are their lived experiences and not only their lived experiences, but that uh, to, to be in a position where at least it's talked about feels um it's validating and uh i think i think i you know i really appreciate kim saying you know don't it's you're not going to be perfect but that's we're not we're not you know so anyway. thank you everyone i appreciate it Um, okay, so we're way over time. Thank you so much for for giving us more of your time than you even bargained for. <laughs> we really do hope you will consider using this book in class, or if you want to pick up conversations with any of us, please feel free to reach out. Um, if you haven't already, if you would fill out the evaluations survey that um, Victoria posted in the chat, that would be great. And um, we hope you have a wonderful day.